Christ's name. Amen. Wasn't that fun? Yeah, so, such good stuff, such good stuff. Um, okay, so Linda and I went out on a date this last Friday night, and um, all I've got left in my wallet right now is a $5 bill, so this is a poor illustration right from the very beginning. Um, but it should have been a 20 or a 50 or something like that, but this is what I had. Anyway, so we go to the movie theater Friday night, and we see a movie, it was great. Now imagine, imagine that this was a larger bill, and imagine that this bill, I'd somewhere along the line picked it up and it was a counterfeit bill. Now I walked around, let's say for weeks, maybe even months with this thing in my pocket, thinking it had the power to do something for me. But as I carried it around, it had no power. I did not know it had no power until I got to that counter, amen? And I went and I put it across and that person would have said to me, now none of this happened that person would have said to me, you're going to have to have some other form of payment, Pastor Josh, because this is no good. And I would have discovered in that moment, in the moment that I most needed it, that there was no power in that bill. Now, this is kind of the concept that we're utilizing for this next series that we're doing. It starts today. But what if we're going through our life with what we believe is a real faith? And it's not. We're calling the series My Counterfeit Faith. What, what, what if you think that your religion is a true faith in Jesus Christ? And what if there's no power there? And you don't know. What if the week two, what we're going to talk about is community. What if the friends that you have around you and the people that you have around you, you think that it's good, strong community and those people will be there for you when you most need them. And what happens when you walk up to the counter and the life moment happens and they're not the community that you thought they were? We're going to talk about counterfeit community versus real community. What about your identity? See, the world hands you, this is week three, world hands you an identity and you think this is who I am because this is what people have told me I am. But what if, what if God has said something different about who you are? You've got a counterfeit identity. And then lastly, this world gives you a purpose and says, walk this out, live this kind of a life. And what if you're living the wrong life and God has a different purpose for you? Today, we're talking about that relationship with God. And is it real? Now, I'm going to start with my own personal story, partly because we're going into the school year, and when people buy school supplies, there's a sense of beginning in America, right? Like, there's a sense of a new year, a new beginning. There's a new schedule, right? Like, like let's go. That's, that's the feeling of right now. Plus, in this community in Lawton, Oklahoma, because we're attached to Fort Sill, this is also coming out of PCS season. So we've got a bunch of brand new families here doing their next chapter. And so if I am your pastor this morning, I need to introduce myself to some of you, and I need to tell you my story. So here's a little bit about how I came to faith in Jesus Christ. I grew up in the church. I sat in a wood pew. I listened to good, solid Bible teaching every single week. And I knew the Bible, and, and I had memorized a bunch of scripture, knew all the hymns by heart. And if you ever, God help you, came against me in Bible quiz, I would destroy you. I was that good. I just knew it, okay? And, and I served on the sound team, and I was part of the youth group, and I went to Sunday school. I did all the things. I went to Christian camp. I went to Christian concerts. I listened to that music. I, I mean, I had the bumper sticker on the car, right? Like the whole thing. And when I was five years old, I remember there was, a, there was an opportunity, and I went and I prayed the sinner's prayer, and I think it was a vacation Bible school or something like that. And I went and I prayed the sinner's prayer, and mom said, you know, it's time for you to go see the pastor and see if you should get baptized. And going to meet the pastor, that was scary business, amen? Like you went into this room, and there he was, Joe Olson. And he asked me questions, trying to figure out whether or not I, I truly meant what I had said. And, and he's sitting here asking me these questions. And he thought, he determined that, yes, my faith was real. It wasn't. It wasn't his fault. But he thought it was, and I thought it was. Parents thought it was. Went and got baptized. And people give you cards and gifts when you get baptized. It's a weird little Christian thing. I don't know why. But they did. And I just kind of kept living my Christian life thinking that everything, and I had, the, I had the counterfeit bill in my wallet. You know what I'm saying? And I'm living life, doing my thing, and, 
it wasn't until I reached the teen years. And when I reached the teen years, what started to happen is it started to become more and more clear, not that I was really paying attention, but it started to become more clear that I was living a double life. Have you ever lived a double life? You're one person in this place and you're a completely different person somewhere else. And you've got to kind of keep track. It's exhausting. And that's what I was doing on Sunday morning. I was a particular kind of person and I talked a particular way and I knew what the lingo was, knew what I was supposed to do. And then when it was Friday and Saturday night, I was a much different person. And I remember I abused alcohol. I abused people. I did things with young ladies that I should not have done and I won't go any deeper into that except to say that when you're a Christian kid growing up in the church, this idea of premarital sex was kind of the unforgivable sin. Do you know what I'm saying? Like of all the things that you were going to do as, as a teenager, this was the one line you should never, ever cross. And let's be clear, I don't think you should. But it became a rule that I could kind of twist around. Because no matter what I was doing, at least I wasn't doing that. At least I wasn't cussing. At least I wasn't smoking cigarettes. I mean, Nancy Reagan told us not to do drugs, and I didn't do drugs. So at least I wasn't doing those things. And so, so when it came to those things, I felt like I was okay. And I wasn't. And I still lived for me. And I lived that double life, but the, the, the most insidious thing that was going underneath the surface, surface, and I didn't realize it until much, much later, is that I would do what I wanted to do. And that's why it's like I only cared about these really big lines that you shouldn't cross. I didn't care about all the small, medium lines. My heart was dark. And when I sinned against God, I did not care that it hurt God. You're like, you can hurt God. The, the scripture says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit with your sin. And all it's trying to say is that if God loves you as much as the Bible tells you that he loves you, you know part of that thing that you can't get past is that he's made himself emotionally vulnerable to his children. You can't get past that. You parents know that. The more deeply you love them, the more you care about their life. And when they're in pain, that means you're in pain. And God says, if you walk down a dark road and you hurt my other kids and you hurt you, that's going to hurt me. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit with your sin. And I was grieving him all the time. And I eventually went to this, this uh, you know, Christian experience, and, and it was some dumb little youth group moment where the youth pastor like, made you write down the 10 top priorities in your life on a sheet of paper. Now, any good Christian kid would have seen that coming a mile away and known exactly what they were supposed to do in that moment. What goes in the first slot? Jesus, of course. And God gave me miraculous ignorance in that moment and blindness. And he caused that moment to be revealing for me. And I sat there and I just marked out all 10 things. And as this good church kid, I marked out all 10 things. And I think number one was my stereo, pretty sure. Really deep, right? Right? And as soon as I saw that list and the youth pastor said, this is what this was supposed to look like, and I saw it, my heart was shattered because I knew in a moment who I really was. And you got the bumper sticker on your car, but look at the list. Jesus didn't even make the top 10. And it wasn't that I just didn't figure out how to play the game right. It was a revelation of what my heart really was. I didn't care. And I admitted it without meaning to admit it. And as soon as that moment happened, I realized what I had done. I realized I was a hypocrite. And I felt the fire of hell on me right then. And God had me. And there was another church service coming up. And I decided before the church service that I was walking up at the end. You ever do that? walk into a church service and I'm like, they might be preaching about money today. I don't know what they're going to preach about, but I'm going forward because I need to. And I did. And I went to the the front at the end of that service and I gave my whole life to God. And I was desperate and I was terrified and just begging for mercy. I said, God, come in and save me for real. Terrified that 
I was terrified it was going to be fake again. Terrified. God, make it real. And I imagine my, my whole life as a car in that moment, kind of a dumb illustration, but that's the way I saw it. And I was like, God, take the steering wheel of my life. That's what I asked him because I knew I had been in that seat the whole time. And then immediately after I said, God, take the steering wheel of my life, which I know is a country song, I know. <laughs> it wasn't then, at least I don't think it was. So take the steering wheel of my life. But I immediately said, and then don't screw me up, please. Now, if you analyze that second thing, which I didn't at the time, but if you analyze that second piece, you can see the authenticity that was in it. Because what I was doing with the first line, it was so real to me that the immediate next fear is that God was going to screw up everything else if I actually gave him control. And that was the story of my whole life up until that point is I better be in charge or he'll screw it up. So there was surrender, a little bit of fear as well. But my faith became real. Many of us, we try out the faith and we have a counterfeit and we don't understand. And it leads us to a particular pain point See if I can explain this to you. We got the pain is I tried faith and faith didn't work. See, many of us don't get to that point where we realize it was fake and then we know what to do. Many of us come to a place where we walk up to the counter and we go to spend our faith and it's got no power for us. And that's taken a thousand different forms in this room is we thought we had something real with God and we crossed a particular moment, a particular trial, a particular crisis happened. And we stepped back from it. We're like, my faith didn't work. And I don't get why. And when it doesn't work, we start to believe the first lie. Which is, if my faith didn't work, maybe it's because God isn't real. And that's, if you're a good church kid, you would never say that lie out loud. Ever. But you feel it. Maybe it means that God isn't real. And then the second lie is kind of like it. If it didn't work, maybe it's because I didn't work hard enough. Where's my church kids at? Right, like it didn't work. I'm not experiencing what I'm supposed to experience because I'm not working hard enough. And if it's because I'm not working hard enough and I've worked really hard up until this point, then that must mean that God is so holy that no matter how hard I work, at least for me, I'm not going to reach him. Maybe everybody else is, but for some reason, something's broke about me and I'm never going to reach him because he's so far away. And if he's that far away, if he's that hard to reach, it may as well be lie number one that's true because even if he's real, he's not real for me. And these lies creep in because of the pain that we experience. Yeah, you feel that? You go to the pharmacy shelf, right? And you're in pain. So you go to the pharmacy shelf and what do you do? You look for the, the medicine that's gonna make you feel better. And when it doesn't, this is just human experience. When it doesn't make me feel better, it doesn't have the right effect, then what do I do? I go to the next bottle and I try the next thing. And many of you, you you've already, several of you have already even told me that's part of your story is you tried Christianity, you'll say, in the past tense. And I found out it didn't work. And now I'm here, pastor, because my mom's dragging me or my, my spouse is dragging me to church. But I tried Christianity and it didn't work. And we're just moving on to the next bottle on the shelf. There's a, there's a story with King Saul in the Old Testament. If you know King Saul, you're thinking like, ooh, you know, King Saul, he's a bad king, you know? It's like all kinds of bad stories about King Saul. But he wasn't always a bad king. And there was this one story with King Saul where he did make a bad choice, and I want to tell you about it because I think, I think it helps us understand this just a little bit more. King Saul was supposed to fight a nation called the Amalekites. He was supposed to take the, the army of Israel, and they were supposed to have a battle. And God said, fully destroy them. And I know that stirs up all kinds of questions, like why would God do that? And God even says, and I want you to destroy even all the animals of the Amalekites. 
And part of what I believe God was trying to do was saying, I'm not going to leave any possessions for you in this, Saul. And so Paul, Saul goes and does the battle, and he fights, and, and he wins. And instead of destroying the animals like God had told him to, Saul decides to keep the best animals, the prettiest animals, the most plump animals. He keeps those. And so Samuel, the prophet, is sent by God to go meet him on the battlefield. And Samuel comes along, the first words out of his mouth, he's like, why do I hear the sound of animals still? And Saul gives him an excuse. Saul in the moment says, it's because I was going to sacrifice those animals to God. And here's his reply, 1 Samuel 15, 22. He says, what is more pleasing to the Lord? This is Samuel, the prophet, talking. He says, your burnt offerings and sacrifice or your obedience to God's voice. Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice. Submission is better than offering the fat of rams to God. What's he saying there? Is he saying, Saul... I I never cared about what you did to the animals, actually. I was after your heart, sir. That's what I wanted. And instead of just doing what I had asked you to do and have me be in the driver's seat of your life, what you actually did is you sidestepped me like a Christian. You sidestepped me over here and said, but I did this other thing for you, God. Isn't it great? And we do that, don't we? Like, like, let's just be really real about our own personal experience. Like, we'll, we'll be going through a marriage and things will get so bitter and so much unforgiveness there and, and, and so difficult to deal with that we'll run away, won't we? We'll run away from our families and, and instead we'll go and we'll pour ourselves into our career. And then when they ask us about it and say, why aren't you around? You'll say things like, I'm just trying to provide a wonderful life for you. And they're too smart for you, aren't they? Because when you say that, they know what's actually true. They know you sidestepped them. And you tried to give them a substitute. And if you could, if you could really ask them the question, what they would say is what we really wanted all along was your heart, not your money. We do the same thing with our kids and we run away from our kids and we run away to other things or God wants to work on certain parts of our character and our heart, and we run, and we'll even pour ourselves into ministry and into community service. And we'll do all these things that we're throwing at God while God's saying, that's not the thing I asked for. I asked for this. And when you do that, that's not me in the driver's seat of your life. That's not me as Lord and King of your life. That's me as a Savior that you think you can manipulate. God's after your heart. Matt Chandler, Pastor Matt Chandler said it like this. And these are big words, so forgive me. Therapeutic, moralistic deism has replaced the biblical gospel. What in the world does that mean? So let's back it up. Deism is I just have an intellectual belief that God exists. Does that make me a Christian? No. So I have an intellectual belief that God exists, plus I've got some morality because I know that there's some rules and God's kind of a king and maybe I should do some of the things that he tells me to do. So I add that. And then therapeutic in the sense that it's like, I also pursue the faith because I'd like some therapy, please. Because my marriage needs some help, my kids need some help, my money needs some help, these other areas of my life need some help. So I've showed up to church today because I'd like some help, please. It's okay. It's an okay place to start but it is not a foundation for your faith. And if these are all you're bringing to God, those are not foundations for your faith. So let's pick them apart a little bit. The first one is that moralistic faith, like I'm bringing a moralistic faith to God. Let's do that one first because that's what Saul was trying to do. See, God, I'm being moral. I'm following some of your laws. Doesn't that make it all okay? It's what I was doing as a kid growing up. I grew up in church, right? Like, like I'm being a moral guy. God's like, no, I see right through to your heart though. And that's not it. But I tried not to sleep with my girlfriend, God. And I didn't cross that magic line, God. I didn't smoke cigarettes, no alcohol, said no to drugs. So now, God, because I did all the big things during my teen years, Right? And sometimes parents give in to this too, don't they? 
Like sometimes our parent, uh, us as parents, sometimes we'll steer our kids toward a moralistic faith. Because gosh, if we could get them through the teen years without getting somebody pregnant or getting in jail or getting addicted to drugs, isn't that what it's all about? And so sometimes we settle for the lie of a moralistic faith too as parents. We should admit that. Sometimes we sown that into our kids, that kind of expectation. These are the unforgivable sins in the church. You really need to pay attention to these things. They are not the unforgivable sins in the church. They are not. And so we get to that spot, we make it through our teens, and we're like, oh, I did it. And now God owes me. Because I did the things that he required, and so I didn't sleep around. So guess what that means? That means my marriage better be good, God. I have every expectation. It means my job. It means everything should go good. And then when it doesn't, everything comes crashing down because I signed up for a moralistic faith. And it became a way for me to try to push God around and manipulate him. A therapeutic faith is, is similar, but it's just a tad different. A therapeutic faith comes and it's, instead it's me saying, God, if you're real, then I ought to see your therapy in these other ways. And if I don't see your therapy in these other ways, then it must mean you're not real. And so I've come to church for these classes, and I'm going to do some of these things. And I do expect all these things to go well. And when, when someone takes on a faith that looks like that, it's based on those kinds of rules. And then what happens if their marriage crumbles? What happens what happens if their career crumbles? What happens if they actually get cancer? What happens if their kid does go to jail? What happens if any of these bad things happen? Then are they questioning whether or not the faith is actually true? Well, why would they question whether or not the faith is true? It's because they had these expectations of the faith. I've come, God. You're supposed to bring your side to the equation. And that is not a biblical faith. Jesus is your Lord. He's your king. King David in Psalm 23, I feel like we keep going back to this, but it's like King David in Psalm 23 says what? He says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you're with me. You know what King David doesn't say? He doesn't say, because there would never ever be a dark shadow of the valley of death. <laughs> because if I followed God, then he owes me. If I follow God, then I can demand. Now he says, even if I totally worship him, totally love him, totally give my life to him, that doesn't mean I'll get this kind of candy coming back out of the machine when I pull the lever. It doesn't mean that. And it may go tough. But what David says is that God will never leave me in the midst of it. And so in the good times and in the bad times, he will be so near to me and he will love me. And that's the promise. And that's the real faith. We're going to go to John chapter 3. If you've got your Bibles, go to John chapter 3. It's not because the sermon is starting now if you're panicking. It's okay. <laughs> I just want you to see this passage. This is about Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus. This is one of the most famous passages in all of Scripture. And what many of us don't know is this conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus. It's a conversation with, between a person who was discovering that they had a counterfeit faith. And you're about to get Jesus' interview with him. It's funny, when you read the Gospels, and, and the Gospels are the telling of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, his three years on this earth, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, a lot of them tell their stories really, really quickly. Have you noticed that? You get like just three or four verses about this massive thing, and then it moves on to the next thing. The book of John is very different. John like stops and settles in and says, I'm going to give you an entire chapter that's just one, one conversation. And it's really, really cool. 
So that's what you're about to get with Nicodemus here. Nicodemus was a Pharisee, which means he's super passionate about his faith. He's super religious, knows the Bible better than you and me. He's incredible, and he's an older guy. He's also a member of the ruling class, which was the Sanhedrin. So he also had political power. Now, he's going to come and have a conversation with Jesus, probably, I'm going to do a little bit of read between the lines here, probably because he had heard about what Jesus was doing in his miracles. And he wanted to get a little bit closer. So verse 1, now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night. Notice that. At night. Why do you go to and see somebody at night? <sighs> like, lots of good answers. None of them are good reasons, right? Probably. He knew that people were against Jesus, nervous about Jesus. He did not want to be associated publicly. He just wanted to talk. So he came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, so he's kind of, uh, you know, flattering him. We know that you are a teacher who has come from God, saying nice things to him, being very respectful. For no one could perform the signs that you're doing if God were not with him. So he's saying, you're clearly a rabbi. You know some stuff spiritually. You're doing some cool miracles. That's all well and good, right? So he's starting this very, very nicely, but very, very safely. Jesus replies, verse three, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Jesus goes, boom! Like you bring some respect and some flattery to me, Jesus hits him with truth. And it's not like some people ought to be born again, Nicodemus. We're not up here in the clouds. We're not talking philosophy. He says, you, you will not see the kingdom unless you're born again. Very confrontational. And born again, isn't that interesting? Notice he does not say, you'll see the kingdom of God if you work harder, if you clean up these sins, if you really seek God deeply. Uh, he doesn't do any of that. He says, you got to be born again. Really interesting language, right? So I want to take you over to Galatians 6.15. So we're going to sidestep to another passage really fast because I want you to see another way of saying this. 5.16 says, it doesn't matter whether you've been circumcised or not. Circumcision was the religious right that got you into the Jewish faith if you were not in the Jewish faith. And Paul's saying here, it doesn't matter whether you've been circumcised or not. What counts, what counts is whether we have been transformed into a new creation. Like you've been rebuilt from the ground up as a completely different kind of person spiritually. This is the kind of extreme language that Jesus is using when he says born again. It's not this tiny little decision. Again, it's not working harder. So then go to verse four. So we're back to John three again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Nicodemus must be old. And he's worried about himself. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. So Nicodemus is trying to take the conversation and he's trying to make it into a debate. Do you see? He's trying to have this nice casual, like, we're sitting here at a table, Jesus. Like, you're an equal with me. We're talking about God stuff. Let's have a discussion. And Jesus just keeps making it personal. Jesus answered, verse five, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and the spirit. And just real quickly, when he says of water, I think he means of the water of the womb. I'm, like when you get physically born, because look at what he says in the next phrase, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at me saying, Nicodemus, you must be born again, personal again. Now, we're not going to debate this. Like, let's talk about you, and let's talk about your soul. Because Jesus knows there's a problem. And he's talking to this amazing spiritual leader in Israel with so much accomplishment. And he's saying, you have never been born, Nicodemus. And if you've never been born, you're not alive. That's how confrontational Jesus is being right now. You know how you got born physically and now you're alive? You've never been born spiritually. So I'm talking to a dead man right now. Mm. Very direct, very personal. Verse eight, 
uh, the wind blows wherever it pleases. This Jesus is still talking. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going to be going. So it is with everyone who's been born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. How can this be? So he's finally engaged in the conversation. He's finally expressing his helplessness. He's finally joining Jesus in this personal conversation. I'm not going to bring my intellect to you, not going to bring my education to you. How can this be? And Jesus uses the wind. Don't you love that? Like you can't see wind. What a great illustration. But you can hear the sound of the wind. And you can see it blowing the trees and blowing the leaves around. And you can see the effects of the wind. And you can know that wind happened. But I can't explain to you how. And Jesus is like, that kind of, like, you know it's real. You know it's happening. But you can't explain it. That's the way it is with people finding God. And so you could look at my story that I told you before and say, well, you grew up in the church and you heard all the right things. And why didn't the magic happen inside of Josh Trublet when he was 12 years old? I don't know. I really don't. It just didn't. God loved me enough to get a hold of me at 18. And when he got a hold of me at 18, I needed to respond to him. And some of you guys hearing this today, you're going to hear this whole thing and you're like, you know what? My faith is alive. It is true. It, it is strong and it works. And I just, I feel nothing but confirmed today and praise God. That's exactly how you should feel. But others of you, I'm talking about this and you're like, uh, I'm not sure. You need to listen. And, and, and well, why didn't it work back here? I, said, I, I don't know. Just respond to God when he comes to you today. Amen? You have two births that Jesus is talking about. And your two births, your physical birth and your spiritual birth, have three things in common. So let me walk through them real quick. Think about your physical birth. It's easier this way. It was a miracle that you don't fully understand even to this day. The way that you were formed and your genetics and all that kind of stuff. Number two, you did not make it happen, right? <laughs> You were just sort of along for the ride on that one. <laughs> and then the last one, it was your birth that made you truly alive. Spiritually, it's the same. If you are spiritually reborn, it will be something that you do not fully understand. You won't make it happen through your efforts, and it will make you truly alive. Verse 14, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. He's referring to an Old Testament story there just really, really quickly. The children of Israel sinned against God. It was a bad moment. Snakes came in and bit them. They were suffering. They were dying. Moses takes this bronze serpent and forms it, a little sculpture and puts it on a pole, sticks it in the middle of the camp. And what God says is, all you have to do, Israelites, is walk up and look. If you choose to look, at that bronze serpent, you're instantly healed. Do I have to repent? Do I have to? No. I'm not asking you to do anything. Just look. Do you see how helpless of a moment that is? Do you see how God is sli trying to slice through all the morality and everything and say, just for one second, do what I tell you to do. And it's not going to be about your effort because I'm going to make it so easy. But will you just look at the serpent? And that's the story in Sunday school, right? And then Jesus says, it's just like that. The son of man meeting himself, he's like, I'm going to be lifted up. What is that? That's the cross. He says, I'm going to be lifted up on the cross. It's about to happen. And when that happens, anybody looks at me, all they got to do is look. And if they'll do it, it's not going to be about their efforts. They'll be saved. Verse 16, for God so loved the world. Anybody recognize that verse? Do you know there's 31,102 verses in the Bible? And that verse is the most popular of all of them. The NFL tells us so, right? <laughs> but it has captured the imagination of so many Christians because it's such a concise moment where Jesus just boils it all down to a very short phrase. 
So this is how this worked. God so loved the world. He gave his one and only son. Talk about the father. Whoever believes in Jesus will not perish, but have everlasting life. Eternal life, depending on your version. The father sent the son to save the Jews? No. The world. Everybody. The white people? No. The world got saved. The world he paid for. The good people, the bad, no, the world. He reached out to the world because he, he loved the world. Do you know that when John 3.16 arrives in your Bible, it's in the middle of a conversation between Jesus and somebody he's trying to convince you've got a false faith. Nic- that's spoken to Nicodemus. Verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. See, the, the ministry of Jesus was not to come and condemn us. He could have. He had every right to, but that's not, that wasn't his job. But to save the world through him, whoever believes in Jesus is not condemned, for, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. So this is how grace works. It's going to sound a little bit mechanical. If you don't choose Jesus, you already have a moral resume before God. I've got a list. It's written in the books of everything that you've ever done. Every lie you've ever told, every person you've betrayed, everyone you've, be- you've selfishly brought destruction into their life, every single moment. And it's all in the books. And that's your resume. And then everything that God wanted you to do that you were too busy for, that's also in there. And you could be judged by that resume. Anybody want that? Not me. And so Jesus has said, listen, if you ignore the cross, okay? If you refuse the cross and the grace that I'm offering you, you won't be judged this way. You'll be judged the old way. You'll be condemned already. Instead, take what Jesus is offering you, amen? Verse 19, this is the verdict. It's like his summary statement. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. And this is where he gets to the heart of it for Nicodemus. And if you look closely, you'll see Josh Trueblood in these words and you'll see King Saul in these words. You'll see all of us in these words. So grace is free and grace is easy. Then why don't we all take it? And Jesus is like, there's a reason we don't all take it. Because we kind of like the steering wheel. And our deeds are evil. And we don't like light. We like what we have. It may be dark, but at least it's mine. It may be dark, but at least it was my way. I did it my way. My agenda, my plan, my career, my education, my degrees, the business that I built, my kids, my family, my retirement, my 401k, my, 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 my. Starts when we're two years old in the sandbox and we never stop. And Jesus is like, there's something about it. It's like, like all my stuff and all my agenda, it's evil and it's dark, but we don't want to leave it. And he's just, surrender. You be king. I'm done with the therapeutic savior. I'm done with trying to control God and trying to bargain with him. I'm done with when he tells me one thing, I sidestep it and try to do a Christian-y thing instead. I'm done with all that. Instead of a God that I can control, a God that I feel like I can boss around, Instead, I'm going to take the overwhelming, ancient, incredible God of the universe into my life. And when he comes in, he will rule. And his rule will be so much better than my rule ever was. And that's what he's asking for. He's like, it's so easy and it's right there. And all you got to do is look, but you have to look. And when you look, it's you're stepping out of the steering wheel and saying, I belong to you now.
And you're going to call the shots now. And it's all you now. And I'm going to care. Is it me? I'm going to be perfect? No, I'm never going to be perfect. I'm going to screw it up constantly. But I'm going to keep giving it back to you. Because you're king now. And that's the walk with Jesus. That's how it works. If you've tried the faith and it didn't have power for you, I believe this is why. Would you guys stand? Online folks, I love you. I see you. Uh, We're going to pray together. And again, if we're telling these stories, if we're walking through this and you're like, gosh, there is power and I know him and I love him. Praise God. Be affirmed today. But if the Holy Spirit's coming in and saying, you should have walked the aisle three weeks ago. You know what I'm saying? If he's got a hold of you today and says, this is you, this is you today. And your heart is just going 90 miles an hour right now. Because you're like, if I admit it to myself, the pastor's going to make me do something. I know he is. Give in. Give in to what the Lord's trying to do in your soul. It can be different. So we're going to pray. I'm not going to make you come up front. It'll be a hand-raising Sunday instead. I'll ask you to raise your hand. If you want to be included in this prayer, we're going to pray a very special prayer. And it's a prayer where you give yourself to God. Where you say you weren't Lord before, you weren't king before, but I want you to be king from now on. Huge moment for you. And God, God cares, okay? If I've made this sound complex to you today, it's because I've taught it wrong. It's not complex. The thief on the cross... Guess what? He bypassed moralism and therapeutic faith and just did not even think about it. Just said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The sloppiest, clumsiest sinner's prayer of all time. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. And somehow it didn't break in him. And he reached out to Jesus and it was real. It was all real. And God God knew And maybe you're like me and maybe it broke. And, but God's not giving up on you. So I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask you to raise your hands. If you bow your heads and close your eyes. You folks online, take this just as seriously as we do in this room. Have your moment with God. But if you want to be included in this prayer, I'm going to ask you to boldly raise your hand high. Don't give me one of these subtle things. All the way up, let's go. If you want this to be real, you're like, this is my moment, then let's go. So I am praying, this is my prayer. Hands all across this room, praise God. Praise God. We're all gonna pray this together, phrase at a time. Dear Lord Jesus, I've tried it on my own and it did not work and there is no power in my faith Jesus save me today forgive my sins make me reborn I love you I want to follow you I want you to be king take the steering wheel of my life and please don't screw me up You are so good to us. Thank you for not giving up on me. Thank you for giving me another chance. I love you, Lord. In Christ's name, amen.